Five creepy stories of people missing in the woods. It's strange enough when people go missing, but to disappear in a seemingly endless forest adds a terrifying element to these cases. The stories on this list are truly frightening. These are five creepy stories of people missing in the woods. Number five, Trenny Lynn Gibson. On October 8, 1976, 16-year-old Teresa Trenny Gibson from Knoxville, Tennessee, went to the Great Smoky Mountains National Park together with 35 to 40 of her classmates from Bearden High School. The students, with just one teacher and bus driver to supervise, started hiking from Andrews Bald to Klingman's Dome and then back again along the Forney Ridge Trail. During the hike, the students separated into several smaller groups depending on their pace. Trenny was seen with several sections of her classmates at different times throughout the day, but the last time anyone saw her was at 3 p.m. around Klingman's Dome when she left the path after spotting something. She was never seen again. Her disappearance was odd because there were people in front of and behind her. The trail was popular with hikers and walkers, yet no one saw her. When dogs were sent out, they followed her scent to the intersection of the Appalachian Trail and onto the Klingman's Dome Tower which wasn't investigated during the search, then towards a roadside about a mile and a half from the newfound gap. After this, though, the trail went cold. Because the last scent was by a roadside, many believe she was abducted from there, most likely put into a car and taken away. But many don't think an abductor would wait along a steep slope and risk having more than 30 people witness him as they passed. Some people say Trenny may have been forced to hide at Klingman's Dome Tower or went there voluntarily. Since this area wasn't searched during the time, it was certainly a possibility. Afterwards, she might have been taken to the roadside or the nearby parking lot and left the place by a vehicle. Police had no strong suspects. A classmate was initially suspected, and there was also an incident at her home where a young man tried to break into their place and Trenny's dad shot him. The man recovered and vowed revenge, but investigators turned up nothing with these leads. Four days after she disappeared, the search and rescue was scaled back. The search did continue on until October of 1976, but there was no sign of the young girl anywhere. The chief ranger believes she is not in the park at all. The search for her was repeated again in 1981, but this also turned up nothing. To this day, her case remains unsolved. Number four, disappearance of Gary Mathias. On the night of February 24, 1978, Gary Mathias and his four friends, Jackie Hute, Ted Weir, Jack Madruga, and William Sterling, all from Yuba, California, headed to the California State University in Chico to watch a basketball game. All five men suffered from mild mental or psychiatric issues, but none of these prevented them from functioning properly in society. Gary, in particular, was taking medication for schizophrenia, after serving in the military having been stationed in Germany. When the group didn't return to their homes the following day, friends and family grew concerned. The men were supposed to have a basketball game of their own and had prepared their clothing items before leaving. Police then began searching for the men shortly after when they were reported missing. Four days later, a forest ranger found Jack's car at an elevation of 4,500 feet on an unpaved road close to Oroville. The Mercury Montego was in the complete opposite direction from the route that they would have taken home in about two and a half hours from Chico where the game was held. The car was in good working condition and no signs of foul play were discovered. For the next five days, rangers searched the area hoping for some sign of the men, but a snowstorm came through, covering any tracks as well as the possibility of finding them. After hearing about the disappearance, a man named Joseph Scones called police saying he saw the group from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. on the Friday they disappeared. His car had been stuck in snow, and while he was trying to push it, he suffered a mild heart attack. Scones said he saw flashlight beams outside his car and tried to ask the men for help, but the flashlight suddenly went away. Another witness said she saw five men in a red pickup truck on Saturday and Sunday, an hour from where the car was abandoned. She said two of the men came into her store to buy food and use the phone while the rest stayed in the truck. Four months passed and no news of their whereabouts was heard. 
By June of 1978, after the snow began melting, a man noticed a broken window at a Forest Service trailer, and when rangers inspected it, they found the dead body of Ted Weir inside. He appeared to have died from starvation, despite having food available nearby. He was wrapped in eight sheets of blankets, and his feet were badly frostbitten. Police believe he lived for up to 13 weeks after the initial disappearance. Even more baffling, no fire was set in the fireplace which could have kept him warm. Warm snow clothes were untouched and the butane to feed the trailer's heating system was off. A further search of the area revealed the bodies of Madruga and Sterling found on opposite sides of the road, 11 miles from where the car was left. Both of them had died from hypothermia. Two days later, Hewitt's bones, skull, and personal items were discovered. He died from hypothermia as well. However, Gary Mathias still remains missing. Police are still confused by the case. They can't figure out why the group headed in the direction they did and the circumstances that led them to make the choices which resulted in their deaths. There was nothing wrong with the car, and if they tried, they could have gotten it up and running. None of them stopped to help John Scones, which was uncharacteristic for them according to their families. Moreover, the situation in the trailer, where it seems none of them tried to start a warm fire or even eat the food, only adds to this mystery. Number 3. Patricia Meehan Patricia Meehan was a 37-year-old who spent most of her life in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where she grew up and studied for a career in daycare. In 1985, however, she decided to make a change and moved to Bosman, Montana, pursuing work as a ranch hand because of her love for animals. On April 20, 1989, Patricia was seen alive and well by her landlord. However, he felt something was off with her, saying she seemed hyper. By that evening, around 8.15, a woman named Peggy Bueller and her father were driving on Highway 200 in Circle, Montana. It was there that they noticed a car driving on the wrong side of the road. Peggy's car swerved away to avoid a collision, but the car behind them wasn't so lucky. Carol Hines, an off-duty police dispatcher, was shaken up when her car was rammed into. However, she was alive and unharmed. Peggy and her dad pulled over to help and shortly after, Peggy left to find a phone so she could call the police. As they stood by the accident, Carol and Peggy's dad saw a blonde woman emerge from the window of the other car. She walked up to Carol but seemed dazed, as if she was looking right through her. The woman didn't say anything at all and afterwards walked away towards a nearby fence, climbed over it before turning around to look at the scene of the crash like a spectator. Oddly standing there for some time, eventually she turned around and walked into the field before vanishing into the night completely. Soon after, police identified Patricia as the driver of that vehicle. Witnesses pointed to the direction where she went and police followed a trail of shoe prints. That trail led about a mile away from the scene of the crash, but by 3 a.m., they had to give up because the tracks had faded away. When Patricia's parents were informed, they immediately made their way to Montana to help in the search. Volunteers flocked the nearby mountains and terrain, even checking abandoned coal mines, but there was no trace of her. There are countless theories about Patty's disappearance. One is that she suffered retrograde amnesia because of the accident and was unable to recall who she was or her life prior to it. She may not have been aware she was even in an accident at all. Others speculate she may have hitchhiked out of the area, knowingly or unknowingly. Her mom noted that prior to her disappearance, her daughter seemed distraught and had been seeing a psychologist. Witnesses have claimed seeing her after the accident as well. One waitress said she saw her sitting at a table in a restaurant alone talking to herself and that she seemed as if she didn't know where she was. There are also several reported sightings all around the area, but whether it was Patty or not is still up for debate. Today, no one knows where Patricia is or what exactly happened to her. Number 2. Cowden Family During the Labor Day weekend of 1974, the Cowdens arrived at the Rogue River National Forest Campground in Oregon and started setting up camp. On September 2nd, 28-year-old Richard Cowden and his 5-year-old son David were seen inside a general store at around 9 a.m. They bought milk and were seen leaving on foot towards their campsite, 
where Belinda Cowden and her four-month-old daughter Melissa were staying. That evening, the family arranged to have dinner at Belinda's mother's since she lived close to the grounds, but when the family didn't arrive, the mother decided to head to the campsite instead. Once there, she couldn't find anyone, but the family's belongings were still right there. She noted a dishpan filled with cold water, the keys to the family truck, and Belinda's purse were on the picnic table in full view. The carton of milk that Richard bought earlier in the day was still on the table and half full. After several minutes of frantic looking, she decided to inform the police. When cops looked around, they couldn't find anything missing except for the family's bathing suits. A huge search effort was done over the next few days and the family's disappearance became national news. Despite the massive search efforts with the help of various agencies, no trace of the family was ever found. But then, seven months later, on April 12, 1975, two gold prospectors discovered the decomposing body of an adult male tied to a tree close to a hillside. A short distance away was a small cave and inside were the bodies of Belinda, David, and Melissa. These bodies were identified to belong to the Cowden family using dental records since the bodies were so badly decomposed. The autopsy showed Belinda and David were shot using a 22 caliber gun. Melissa was beaten to death and Richard's cause of death couldn't be determined. Police believe Richard was killed where he was found and Belinda and the kids might have been killed elsewhere and moved to the cave later because one volunteer said he had searched the same cave in 1974 and did not find the bodies. As for suspects, the name Dwayne Little showed up. At the time of the crime, Dwayne was a 25-year-old who had just been paroled three months prior for raping and murdering a teenager. Police discovered he was also in the area of the campsite on Labor Day weekend, most likely with his parents. Another family in the area reported seeing three people matching the description of Little and his family sitting in a truck and found them to be unusual. Little denied this, but a miner who lived in the area said they were there because they signed a guest book on September 2, 1974. Moreover, a former inmate who shared time with Little after the incident said he admitted to killing the Cowdens. Despite all the circumstantial evidence, Little has never been officially linked or charged directly for the family's murder. Number 1. Jared Negret. On July 19, 1991, 12-year-old Jared Negret went on a camping trip with a scout troop that consisted of 14 other boys. Jared was 5 foot 2 inches tall and slightly overweight at 150 pounds. He was last seen wearing green pants and a tan shirt, carrying a canteen of water along with some snacks. It was the first overnight trip for Jared. The location was the summit of Mount San Gorgonio in the San Bernardino National Forest in Southern California. Old Grayback, as the mountain is referred to, is the highest peak in Southern California at 11,500 feet and part of the Sand to Snow National Monument. During the trek, another group of hikers spotted Jared straggling behind the scout troop. They notified the leader, but he said he would pick up Jared on the way down. However, when he descended from the mountain, he couldn't find him anywhere. It's believed Jared might have taken the wrong trail and ended up lost. As soon as the scout troop realized he was missing, they hiked back five miles in the dark to get help. Soon, a massive search and rescue effort was mounted to find the lost boy. Volunteers came from as far away as Sierra Madre and San Dimas, and they began searching over 130 square miles, hoping to spot any sign of Jared. During the first three days, they focused on a six square mile radius where they discovered a footprint believed to be from Jared's tennis shoe. They also found discarded candy wrappers and beef jerky, items that Jared had carried. Finally, they also found a camera belonging to him. When they developed the film, they found 12 images. Most were landscapes taken by the boy when he was still with the troop, but the last one shows a self-portrait. It seems he pointed the camera at his face. His family believes he took the photo during the nighttime because the camera flash went off. It's likely he lost the camera when he slid down a portion of the mountainside. For the next two weeks, more than 3,000 people searched all around. Helicopters were sent in and rangers on horseback, but in the end, no further clues were ever discovered. It's now been 27 years since Jared walked into a forest, and still no one knows exactly what happened to him. 
So those were five creepy stories of people missing in the woods. Forests are dark and vast, so when people go missing in them, it's often difficult to find any answers, let alone actually finding the people themselves. If you like this video, then subscribe to our channel because every Saturday and Wednesday, we have new videos coming out. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.